Thoth Hermes podcast. Welcome to the world of the Western esoteric tradition. Hello, friends and listeners, and welcome to another episode, episode 15 of season 7 of the Thoth Hermes podcast. And today is the 5th of December 2021. The year is closing its end. And, uh, well, I'm very happy to have you back here to our show. Welcome to this new episode and welcome to a great interview with somebody who is returning to this show. Second time he is with us, John Michael Greer and following what he was uh, uh, telling us last April. Um, it was a huge success with our audience. So I hope you will enjoy just as much this new episode. But before I delve into the details about this interview with John, let me welcome all of you. All of you who are new to the show and all of you who are returning customers. And first of all, today, I want to say thank you. A one or two new Patreons have joined. So I may say not only thank you to those who are my patrons now and are new patrons, but also would like to invite some more of you to become patrons of the show. We really need your support. It's not made up. We need that. We cannot be without you. And uh, well, if you want to make that show really sustainable, please stay with us and become a patron. Go on the website, thoughthermes.com, T-H-O-T-H-E-R rmes.com there is that patreon button push on it and say how much you want to give us for each show one dollar is the start thing to become a member and well thank you so much if you choose that it would be great um but once you're on the website then that's of course free for everyone you go there and you see all the previous episodes more than hundreds episodes await you there if you haven't heard of them yet or if you missed some of them you can get not only the shows but also all the show notes with a lot of links and information it's really become now a great source of link and knowledge because well you imagine 100 people that we've had on that show and 100 very interesting people and so everyone has a link there and you can find their work it's it's really becoming a little encyclopedia well um i also would like to uh, point you to the feedback of course i like i do every week hope you don't mind i say that every week but well i need more feedback i always get a few and i'd love more feedback through twitter feedback through facebook but mainly through email info at thoughthermis.com or through the contact page on the website which is just there and you just push on the contact side page and you have a contact form that you can fill in and send me questions or criticism or ideas or whatever is on your mind about this podcast do let me know right this interview this week is a few minutes longer and i think uh, you will enjoy that so i won't be too long here today with that intro um i would like to present you our first piece of music we have three pieces of music as always this week it's again music that i chose and next week i think we will have again music from some of our listeners one of the audience who gave me some of their music uh, let be surprised next week but this week now if we have more a bit eclectic once again the first piece is um, by somebody who i believe many of you might know dean evanson he is a new age musician of a certain age already and uh, he created with his wife uh, I believe a, 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 a company, Soundings of the Planet, they are called in Tucson, Arizona. And um, so they have done a lot of recordings in that field. And we are going to hear from their 2004 
recording Sacred World Chants. One of the tracks, which is called John St. John, Don St. John. Um, uh, and the whole, the whole CD, that whole recording there shows different meditational musics for different religious um, currents or different religions, uh, but always the aim to show you that the, they have all common ground, that they, we are all worshipping the same supreme beings. Um, so that's John St. John by Dudley Evanson and, well, uh, sorry, Dudley is his wife by Dean Evanson, I wanted to say. <laughs> so I hope you're going to enjoy that. And, uh, well, why wait any longer? Let's start this episode with John St. John. Enjoy.
Dean Evanson, Sacred World Chants, John St. John. Okay, and now another John, John Michael Greer. And you can imagine that I'm more than pleased to have him back on the show this week. Um, you have been really excited, everyone, to have him with us on the show uh, a few months ago. Now, it was in April. Uh, I believe it was the highest download figures we had had ever. So, and of course, it's a great pleasure for me for, so for that reason, but for various other reasons to have John Michael Greer back here. He's a widely read author and blogger. And what I like about him is not only his extraordinary knowledge, which you will find out again this week, because we are going to talk uh, about the uh, occult revival of the 19th century. So it's a historical episode today. He is going to talk about that with me and I think it uh, will be really really interesting for you the statements he make and the ideas he have about that history quite fascinating and the big big overview that he has on the subject you can really learn a lot from him what I also like about John Michael is that he is um, very much also involved in uh, spirituality and ecology and builds bridges there and he also talks a lot not in this show but in his books in his blogs about the future of the industrial society um, he was the great archdruid of the ancient order of druids in america and um, he he is really an active occultist as well himself so having said all that um, that explains of course why he knows so much and uh, usually i read you a little excerpt from a book by the people that I present to you. I've done that last time uh, when he was with us. Um, today I chose not to, to read from a book, but rather from his blog, because just to inspire you, I can only read a short part of it, uh, but it will show you how well he writes also there, and maybe will inspire you to go on echosophia.net, which is the blog that is called with subtitle Toward an Ecological Spirituality. And that's really what it is. Uh, and I think we all occultists need to be aware of those things, and uh, um, we should be we should be having more, paying more attention um, on those subjects. So um, I hope you will go and read his blog also there because it is really, really, really worth it. Okay, so uh, John Michael Green will be coming to us. Uh, shortly just to read you two or three paragraphs from that latest blog entry from december the first so very fresh on his echo sophia blog which is called an empire of dreams there's a fond belief among the comfortable classes of our time and for that matter every other time that the future can be arranged in advance through reasonable discussions among reasonable people popular though this notion is it's quite mistaken what history shows, rather, is that the future is always born on the irrational fringes of society, bursting from uh, forth among outcasts, dreamers, saints, and fools. It then sweeps inward from there, brushing aside the daydreams of those who thought they could make the world do as they pleased. Consider the Roman Empire in the days of its power. While its politicians and bureaucrats laid their plans and built their careers on the presupposition that their empire would endure for all imaginable time, a prisoner on a Mediterranean island, exiled for his membership in a despised religious cult, saw the empire jacked with wars, famines and plagues, ravaged by horsemen galloping out of the east and finally conquered and fallen into ruin to be followed by a thousand years of triumph for his faith. We call him John of Patmos today, and his vision forms the last book of the New Testament. He was a figure of the uttermost fringe in his own era, isolated, powerless, and quite possibly crazy. He was also right. Thus, it's important to keep a close eye on the fringes of contemporary culture, the places where the future is being born out of the surging tides of unreason. One of the things I watch most closely with this in mind is the burgeoning realm of contemporary conspiracy theories. Those reveal far more than the conventionally minded imagine, irrespective of their factual accuracy or lack of same. 
as Alain de Botton commented of religions, whether conspiracy theories are true or not, is far and away the least interesting question about them. To begin with, the popularity of conspiracy theories is a sensitive measure of the degree to which people no longer trust the conventional wisdom of their time. That's an explosive issue just now, and for good reason. The conventional wisdom of our time is fatally out of step with the facts on the ground. Look across the whole range of acceptable views presented by qualified pundits, and by and large you'll find that the randomly chosen fortune cookie will give you a better guidance. The debacle in Afghanistan is only one reminder of the extent that the popular joke about economics, what do you call an economist who makes a prediction, wrong, that can be applied with equal force to most of the experts whose notions guide industrial societies. Well, well, a lot to be thought about. But now we go back by 150 years, at least, almost 200 years, and we will talk to John Michael Greer on the phone and talk to him about the occult revival. Enjoy. Here comes the interview. It is an enormous pleasure to have John Michael Greer back here on the Thos Hermes podcast. John, good evening. Welcome back. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be on again. Well, thank you. And um, well, actually, I think I might tell our our listeners uh, why we are going to discuss tonight the subject we are going to discuss tonight. Initially, we were going to meet today in order to talk about your new book and uh, uh, well, well, we'll tell people later when it really will be, because, of course, in those days, you never know when things happen. And the book had mm-hmm. to be postponed, not from your end, but from the publisher's end. And um, then we said, hmm. As you as usual, they had trouble getting paper. That's exactly. That's amazing, yeah. isn't it? In those days. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. So we were thinking, well, but we should use the time we blocked for that. And because there's always so much to talk, we will talk about that book when it will appear in a couple of months. So that's an announcement that John will be back on the show. But um, so today we decided to talk about the history of the occult and about a very particular subject within that history. Uh, the occult revival of the 19th century. And we will extend a bit into the 20th century because John and I, we both believe that, of course, you cannot just stop maybe at World War I because it goes much beyond that. And we will try to figure out why. So, uh, JMG, as people call you, um, how, how would we, uh, how should you define occult revival maybe we should start with the definition first okay um to get to to make the definition make sense i want to do a little context building first Mm -hmm. the thing to keep in mind here is that occultism which had been um a very important thread in west in western cultures all the way through the renaissance and the early modern period got shoved aside um discarded thrown out of of pop of polite culture Mm-hmm. Um, very, very forcefully um, in the second half of the 17th century, say from 1650 to 1700, a little later than that um, in, in Central Europe. But um, all of a sudden, you couldn't talk about that stuff. And th- there were a few exceptions. There were a few um, sort of venues and places within within Masonic lodges, within some other places. But generally speaking, um, any any occult topic was rendered just completely out of line. Intelli- you know, cultured and intelligent people don't deal with that sort of thing. Or if mm-hmm. they do, they keep their mouths very tightly shut. Okay. Then, <laughs> then came Alephas Levy. And um, you had... Um, from from sort from some initial stirrings in the early 19th century, you suddenly had an explosion of interest in occultism, um, heralded by his book *Doctrine and Ritual of High Magic*, mm-hmm. and all of a sudden the occult was back. A lot of people, a lot of intellectuals, a lot of cultured people, um, a lot of a lot of public interest refocused on occultism and helped lay the foundations for the the ongoing interest in the occult that we've seen since then. That that transformation of, of interest, that redirection of interest back to occultism after the period of, of where, where occultism was suppressed, 
that's the occult revival of the 19th century. And yes, it, it's, I mean, it's, it's like if these are still very much with us now, but it was also, you know, a, a process that kicked off um, in the middle years of the 19th century and continued straight through into the 20th. Absolutely. But maybe we, you could tell us why this suppression happened. I mean, it was the church, basically the Catholic church, basically. But why do you think suddenly, why had it been accepted earlier and suddenly okay. everything that was occult uh, was oppressed? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, actually, in the, in this case, it wasn't the Catholic Church. The Catholic okay. Church has been down on occultism since you know since Roman times. Yeah. Um, that's a kind of that's a kind of continuous process. There have been a few mo a few moments in church history where there was a little less focus on that, a, l a little more willingness to expand the the, the range of possibilities. But of course, the door was always slammed as quickly as possible. Usually, as soon as a new pope got elected. Mm -hmm. But no, what happened? What what made, what caused the suppression? Of occultism in the in the late the latter part of the 17th century was the scientific revolution. You had right. um, on the one hand you had um, the 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 early scientists and and researchers saying no 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 we can understand the world as a purely material phenomenon we don't you know just throw out mm. all of this all the rest of this stuff. I mean, Isaac Newton's theory of gravitation was considered very suspect at first because it required you to, it required people to accept the existence of something of, of gravitational forces they couldn't see. Mm -hmm. it, it, you, you couldn't actually tap on with something. And so it was thought to be suspiciously supernatural. <laughs> um, and, but that, that was the, the, yeah, it was very much a push in the direction of a purely materialist worldview. That was an intellectual trend. It had an enormous amount of backing within for with the rise of the the mercantile classes of what became the capitalist class. The development of a of a, a vision of society that was based entirely on money mm -hmm. and on and other quantitative measures, and the rejection of qualitative issues and and of um, the kind of bonds of loyalty and of emotion that had that had bound together the earlier feudal and post feudal systems. So materialism was the banner, um, mercantilism and capitalism were, were the, the driving forces. Getting rid of magic was, um, was essential to the, the, sort of, the sort of triumph of, of the scientific worldview. And, and there was a reason for that, of course, because an enormous number of people in the early days of the sciences were up to their eyeballs in occultism. And yeah. they didn't want to talk about that. They wanted to distance themselves from that. So Isaac Newton, well, of course, he was an alchemist. He spent as much time studying alchemy as he did, you know, figuring out gravitation. Sure. Um, Robert Boyle practiced alchemy. A lot of the, a lot of the significant scientists had at least dabbled, and but they wanted to distance themselves from that. And their successors and heirs, especially, wanted to say, no, 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 no. That was all the superstitious nonsense of the, mm -hmm. you know, the discarded past. We're turning our back on that and building a world of reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I see. Well, we are still in the middle of that today, aren't we? <laughs> oh, the, yeah. That, oh, the same. This, the rhetoric has not changed one iota. Absolutely. Um, it is. We've we've gone from the mercantile class to the capitalist class to the manage the corporate managerial class, which more or, yes. or less runs things now. But they've still got that banner of the reason, and reason means whatever we say it does. Absolutely. Whatever pays our bills. <laughs> Absolutely. It's also interesting. I, I When I did research for our talk today, I wanted mm -hmm. to bring that up a bit later in the conversation, but I think it fits here. I found a cover of the Time magazine in June 1972, which mm -hmm. in big letters said the occult revival. And when you <laughs> looked up the article and it had a kind of a Baphomet head also on, on, that, mm -hmm. on, that, on that image. And when you looked it up, it was pure purely about some form of Satanism, not even mm -hmm. Satanism in general, you know, and it was called The Occult Revival in 1972 on 1972. Time Magazine. Hmm. Yeah. Now, that's, that's, actually, that's actually kind of a funny story because here in the United States, there was an occult revival in the 70s, rather a large one. Absolutely. It was mostly, it was mostly caused by um, the, the, the development of a paperback, non, of a paperback nonfiction. Um, the paper okay. rack revolution did a lot. We can get into that as we go. Yes. But an, an enormous amount of, of social change in, 
in modern times has come with the development of new publishing technologies. I mean, the printing mm-hmm. press um, in the late Middle Ages caused enormous transformations. Yes. And as printing technologies changed, as they became less expensive, um, as it became easier to produce like le- um, individual lessons and things like that, time as you go, occultism kind of looks at it and picks up and says, ooh, we can have fun with that. Yeah. And so you had in the 1970s this torrent of occult-themed paperbacks. I, I remember them very well. I was there at the time. I was reading those books. Yeah. <laughs> when we all in our age group. <laughs> uh, yeah, I say, anyone, anyone, anyone in our age group has probably. I mean, I still have. I still have copies with the, the garishly ugly color uh, covers, and um, it's one of those things. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But now let's go back to the 19th century. So let's what century. happened? Then exactly at that very moment, why did it happen at that very moment? Of course, you, you mentioned Elafas Levy, um, but mm-hmm. he was probably just the expression of something that was oh, yeah. growing. Well, hmm? the, the, there were there were pe- there were people before his time who were trying to do the same thing. Yeah. Um, you had um, oh the Magus Francis Barrett um, mm-hmm. in England in the in the um, in the Regency period. Actually, think of Jane Austen's characters reading books on magic. Definitely. Barrett was the one they'd be reading, um, <laughs> and you and you had, you had other people. But Levy Levy was more than just a symptom because he he was one of the very first people. He may have been the first person to look at the old magical traditions and to reinterpret them in terms of the philosophy and the intellectual currents of his own time. Mm-hmm. Up until then, um, when you got something like Barrett's book, The Magus, it's all very much cast in the language of the Renaissance. It's all It has that very Gothic uh, yeah. Th- th- yeah. Sort of sensibility, it, and it, 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 it acts as though nobody has learned anything new or nobody has thought any different thoughts since about 1600. If, yeah. if not, if not, and uh, that was probably um, attracted Jane Austen as well when she when she. Oh yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. yeah. Well, that's the thing is, and that's why that that had been that the the whole Gothic literature movement, the tendency to to fixate on the on medieval horrors or what have you, um, that all fed into that. But Levy Levy was going at it from a different direction. Mm-hmm. Um, he he came to magic by way of um, a Polish exile, um, Hoynaronski. Mm-hmm. Um, who is a, quite an intellectual figure in his own right. He's the guy who invented the caterpillar tracks that tanks use today, by the way. Um, <laughs> Ronsky was. And um, also, if um, th- those, of, those of our listeners who are mathematicians may have encountered Ronsky and Constance. That's another thing he invented. He was, ah, yeah. he was, a, he was a strange and interesting cat. But he studied that he had learned a lot of, a lot of occultism and a lot of the particular form of, of the, the Kabbalah, which had been reworked by the Frankist movement in Germany and Poland, and what's now Poland, of course, was yeah. mostly part of the German Empire in those days, uh, or mm-hmm. Prussia at that time. Mm-hmm. But um, the, 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 Fra- the Frankists had been Jew- the, the Frankists were Jews who had converted to a version of Christianity, long, complicated story. But they okay. took their Kabbalistic traditions with them, reworked them in various ways, including with some Christian symbolism and so on. And so that's what Ronsky studied, and that's what Ronsky passed on to, to Levy. And Levy, you know, Levy was a very well-educated cat. He was, um, you know, he was in Paris at a time at the time when that was the cultural capital of the world. Um, yeah. He was a writer. He was he was a voracious reader, and he made the leap of saying, "Hold it! This this stuff that these old tomes are talking about these these strange concepts, I can understand this in terms of modern science and modern philosophy. I can make sense of this." in terms that make sense in the modern world. And that's what he was doing in Doctrine and Ritual of High Magic. He was taking the ideas of magic and saying, okay, let's, you, you know, the physicists are all talking about the, the ether, the luminiferous ether, the substance through which, through which light moves. And these magical stuff, these magical writings, they're talking about this substance called the astral light. Mm-hmm. What if they're the same thing? Mm-hmm. And you know, and here's this 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 guy, this this guy in Germany named Schopenhauer who's writing about the will, of course, and yes. and, and the will and represent you know the world is will and representation. Mm-hmm. Um, and he wasn't getting a lot of publicity in the philosophical scene in those days, but Schopenhauer's stuff got a lot of write ups in in popular media, Absolutely. in the magazines at the time. Yeah. And yeah. so, 
So there's Levy reading the world, the world as will and representation. If, if by representation we think imagination, then we have Levy's basic formula of the world of, of will and imagination is the keys to magic. <laughs> and now, as it happens, I think Schopenhauer met him halfway there. Um, in um, Schopenhauer, the, I've, I've studied Schopenhauer rather a bit. He's of great interest to me. Uh, but yeah. one of the, in one of his other books, uh, the will on the will in nature, he has a chapter where he talks about magic as something that can actually happen, and explains how um, you know his theory actually makes sense of it. I have no idea if Levy read that. I have okay. to document that one way or the other, uh, but certainly Levy was picking that up. And so that's what happened is that Levy came, came out to the world with the, with the, his, this book that was setting out magic, not as a, a, a you know, a Gothic, a romantic Gothic superstition from the middle ages, but as something that made sense in modern terms. Mm -hmm. I didn't know at and, all. I am ashamed. I didn't know at all about Schopenhauer mentioning magic in any of his books. I'm, okay. I'm really, yeah, no, yeah, it's, impressed. It's, yeah. It's, in, it's in the world. It's in on the will in nature. It's uh -huh. you know, Amazing. chase it down. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, 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 and so Levy does this and there had been this sort of slow groundswell of interest in magic all through the first half of the 19th century. Right. Um, maybe it was the fact that with the, with the collapse of the Ancien Regime, with the collapse of, of pre-revolutionary or pre-French Revolution Europe, um, a mm -hmm. lot of people had had their worldviews shaken to the ground. Things were changing very fast. People were open to new ideas. Um, and that was also the case of Levy, also politically, because if I remember well, he was first in the, uh, he was wanted to become a priest, then he had a love mm -hmm. affair, so he was thrown out of the seminar, and mm -hmm. then he was a, quite an active socialist at the time of oh, 1848 yeah. and the, the revolutions mm -hmm. at that time, mm -hmm. the, the, the bourgeois revolution at that time, and uh, quite surprising that he would then, at the time, turn to occultism, was that... Mm -hmm. Did you, in your in your view, did he turn away from his political views to become an occultist, or was that part of this occult revival that it had a new, uh, say, philosophical political background? Well, I think I think the, he his, now his socialism. Of course, we we have to remember that socialism was a much broader and more complex phenomenon in those days. This was before Marx got his stranglehold on the of course, um, yeah, you know, Marxian yeah, ideas, yeah, yeah. and so social socialism. Um, covered the ground from Charles Fourier with his, who was frankly crazy, um, <laughs> who insisted, this is the guy who insisted that the oceans would turn into lemonade once his political system was, ad was adopted. <laughs> there were, there, there were a lot of people writing um, socialist tracts and, or associationist mm. was another term. The idea was that people working cooperatively could make a better world. And so if, if you read Levy's um, political works, like the Bible of Liberty, which was the one that got him some prison time, mm. Um, it's <laughs> mild. It's amazingly mild. He's calling for shocking things like public education. <laughs> Amazing. And, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, but that counted, that counted as socialist at the time. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But so on the one hand, of course, um, he had been, he, his, his socialism was, um, basically a sort of general um, interest in having a less uh, a less screwed up government and mm. French I mean French 19th century politics was enough to drive anyone to radical yeah, yeah, one sure, or another sure, sure. and then and then of course after 1848 um, there was the short-lived Second Republic and then Louis Napoleon um, staged his coup declared the Second Empire Napole as you know, with himself as Napoleon the third um, and all of Levy's political hopes Hopes were over un yeah. until after. Well, actually, until until after very nearly after his death, mm -hmm. because it wasn't. It, it really wasn't until after the the uh, the war of of eighteen seventy. Okay, yeah, exactly. That yeah, and the fall the fall of the, of the second empire. That there mm -hmm. was any chance of getting something something approximating a representative government, little things like that in France. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think to one extent he was looking at the situation and saying, okay, well, that's not going to work. What can I do now that will actually help people? But there is a common thread here because one of the things that's central to Levy's idea of magic is the liberty, the freedom of the human individual. 
He was saying, okay, if we can't do it collectively by means of politics, we can achieve freedom individually by means of will and imagination, by means of self-mastery, self-control, and access to the, to the astral light. Mm-hmm. And so in a certain extent, he was taking his, his ideals and simply moving them into a more um, – into a less overtly political, more individual, more, more spiritual context. Yeah. 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 I see what you mean. Yep. Yeah. And I mean, he was so influential that even somebody like Aleister Crowley would then say he, he was a reincarnation because I think he was, he was, he was born around the time that, that, that uh, a few weeks after, after Levy had died. And yeah. at some point he, at some point he said that about. <laughs> oh yeah. No, you know, he, he, he claimed it. He, he, he worked out this whole series of, of past incarnations all to, for the greater glory of Aleister Crowley. Yeah. As it happens, as it happens, I think he was right in a certain sense, not, not about Eliphaz Levy, but I think he had been an, an occultist in the, in his life immediately before, because there was another occultist who died in 1875 in, within the right window. So to, to reincarnate as Crowley, um, Paschal Beverly Randolph, who was an American, American, African, ah, yeah. American occultist, yeah, 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 and yeah, who yeah, was yeah. who was emotionally unstable, obsessed with sex and magic, um, constantly mm-hmm. got into fights with everybody who helped him, um, and yeah, I mean he he, he was basically the same kind of personality. <laughs> Sounds that familiar, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I figured, yeah, yeah. so figured that PB Randolph reincarnated as, as Alistair Crowley, and <laughs> oh, and, and Ra- Randolph also. Um, love to make up stories about where he got his various teachings and so on. And so yeah, yeah, they, yeah. they had, they had a lot in common. <laughs> yeah, absolutely right. Do, well, I wasn't do aware not, that they had this, that date connection. Like, yeah, yeah, just to, don't, don't mention, don't mention this to, you know, hardcore Alistair Crowley fans. They don't. No, no, no. I, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Um, but, uh, I hope there are a few of them listening anyway, but I know they are not mm-hmm. always agreeing with what I'm saying about uh, Crowley. Well, I don't see <laughs> actually, actually, if they, if they're, pay, if, if there are Thelemites listening to us, I hope they're paying attention because PB Randolph was also the person who invented the core teachings that ended up in the possession of the Ordo Templi Orientis. That is true. So yes. in a certain sense, Crowley was going, going back to his own reincarnational roots. If absolutely. he was PB Randolph. So absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Let, let, let's go back again because let's there, back again. <laughs> there are there are some people, uh, and uh-huh. for example, Robert G. Gilbert, uh, uh, who who says that the occult revival actually for him already started with Swedenborg. What do you say about mm-hmm. that? Oh no, the thing is that there had been this continual low grade burbling of uh, like like a like a, a pot set to simmer. There had been this continual low grade appearance of figures who were. Um, who were definitely can either connected to, the, to occultism on the one hand, or who were simply visionaries. Swedenborg is a great example. Emanuel Swedenborg, he spends um, the first 50 years of his life as a mining engineer. Mm. Um, and then all of a sudden he starts talking to angels. Mm. And it wasn't his idea. The angels just showed up. Mm. And, <laughs> and he wrote, I forget what fantastic number of books taking down, you know, in, the, in his neat handwriting, di- dictations from angels. And they, they ended up turning into, into a church, which is still around. Yes. And, um, and, and, you know, various other, William Blake drew heavily from that. Though Basically, he was, um, the Swedenborgian movement was one of the places where you could go and if you were an occultist in the in the sort of occult underground of the 18th century, you could go to the and you'd be, your ideas would be accepted. Nobody was going to fuss at you because you you know they they were following Swedenborg who was talking to angels. <laughs> and so, I mean, if you want to say that it begins with Swedenborg, then well, you know, you can just keep on going back because uh, you know there's Jakob Böhme. Yeah, There's exactly. um, yeah. who, who was also hugely influential in his own time yeah. Yeah. in the same in the same early 18th century setting that um, you know that, that we have. Um, or to, I mean, the 18th century generally, you have Franz Anton Mesmer. You have all of these figures who come out of various occult groups. Most of them very quiet. Most of them, some of them, quite secretive. Um, but there were Rosicrucian groups. There were various fringe Masonic groups. There was um, people like Martinez de Pasquale. Uh, there was the Order of the Golden Rosenkreuz, and so on. Um, mm-hmm. There was always there were always people who were interested. What Levy did was 
make it public, was put it out there in a yeah. way that yeah. lots of people could pile into it once. So instead of this quiet underground of lodges where you have to make the right knock on the door and um, mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. give the password and the and and the you know the uh, the the yeah. outside guardian will admit you, you know yeah. it was right out there in public. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that that's absolutely right. you're something saying something very important here because that's. A revival could only take place because it went out into the street, so to speak, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, his real name was Alphonse, Alphonse Louis Constant, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and suddenly he turned the Lefos Levy. I believe it was he when he became a member of that Ordre Emetico de la Rose Croix Universelle, no, that he took that name, or am I, it, it am I making that up? I, I don't. I, I don't I don't know if that's specifically when he did so. Certainly, it was around the right time. Mm-hmm. And but yeah, he you know he he was um, he basically he translated his his own name into yes into Hebrew, into Hebrew exactly. yeah, <laughs> and yeah, yeah. which which was one way you know certainly one way to do it if you're a Kabbalistic magician as he as he is he was yeah, yeah. and yeah and yeah. so yeah but so he reinvented himself came you know to some extent it was just a pen name. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah. everybody knows him under that name now. And, and everybody, uh, nobody yeah. talks about Alphonse Constant. Exactly. No. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so there were his works, and mm-hmm. what happened next? Okay, okay. The first thing that happens is that everybody reads Levy, mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, his his works were, um, of course, French was the standard language of scholarship all over Europe and yeah. in much of the much of the European diaspora as well. Mm-hmm. And so, copies of um, not only his initial book, which is the most successful, but his his later works on magic spread very widely. They got a lot of interest, and people people were primed, people were interested in that subject by then. Okay, at that point, we have another another improbable figure. Right, in fact, the same year that that Levy died, now eighteen seventy five, mm-hmm. we have Helena Petrovna Blavatsky. There we are. Yeah, there yeah. we are. Um, we have well, we have actually we have a a group of occultists. We have uh, Blavatsky. We have Emma Harding Britton. We have William Kwan Judge. We have uh, half a dozen others meeting in New York to organize this thing called the Theosophical Society. Mm-hmm. And um, they they all had their they all had their own different their own views as to what it should be. They were interested in making in, in publicly teaching magic. Uh, the group blew itself to bits in internal quarreling. Uh, the Emma Harding Britain went one way, Blavatsky went another. Everyone, but Blavatsky had the had the ability to write something that would like um, as as Levy did that would appeal to a mass audience. Mm-hmm. And so we get ISIS unveiled. Yeah. Um, nobody reads ISIS on Facebook. I was going to say, this is one of those books, everybody says, oh yes, I have it. And nobody <laughs> actually read it. Right? <laughs> yeah, the, thing, the thing is, it was very much a book of its time. Um, um, it was in, in its own way, it's brilliant, but you almost have to be Victorian to really get into it. Yeah. Because it's, I mean, one volume is dedicated to, um, to, show, to pointing out all the flaws in science. <laughs> and the other to sh- pointing out all the flaws in the re- in religion, meaning you know, the mainstream Christian religions of, yeah. of her day. And both the science and the religions have changed so much since then that they don't necess- the books don't necessarily make sense to a lot of people. Yeah. Um, to some extent, her work ended up um, you know spinning out in various other directions. Her the 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 book on science in the hands of people like Charles Fort um, mm-hmm. became the 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 sort of cutting edge for the whole um, rejected knowledge movement. People saying, "Yes, I know official science says this, but they're wrong, yeah. and here is the truth." And so this whole thing spiraled out from that. The religious stuff, of course. Um, Christianity has been backpedaling frantically for um, you know a couple of hundred years now, yeah. and they don't. There's, I mean, they've abandoned so many positions at this point. I don't know what they actually, you know, how much <laughs> they actually hold on to. Yeah, but, true. but so it was a very powerful book in the time, and the the measure of its power was that it succeeded as greatly as it did and rendered itself obsolete. Mm-hmm. But 
Blavatsky, after she had kind of gotten gotten control of the organization that this group of people had founded, she proceeded to move in the direct in a direction that nobody had tried in in a very very long time of having an organized public presence for occultism that was out there giving lectures and um, having meetings and libraries, not the kind of things that you have to make the right knock and give the right password for, but you know, mm-hmm. open to the public. Mm-hmm. Nobody mm-hmm. had done that. And it took off like anything. Um, again, the way that the Swedenborgian movement had, uh, you know, had become the place where occultists went. Um, the Theosophical Society even more so. Yeah. Um, by the by, the beginning of the 20th century, there were theosophical lodges in in most large cities across the Western world. They had libraries, they had lecture programs. If you were interested in the occult, you made a beeline for those. Mm-hmm. And so, people on the one hand, you had um, in a means of networking that allowed people to realize, oh, it's not just me. It's, you know, it's not just me sitting here in the privacy of my room, turning the pages of these obscure French books. It's, there's like thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who share this interest. And that's, that's really when the occult revival went from growing to, you know, <laughs> slam on the gas and, and head to the heavens. Exploding, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah. But w- what was the time, what had changed and the time that it was possible to do that? Um, why? Why couldn't it have happened 50 years earlier? It, it, it may be that nobody thought of it. Mm. <laughs> I, I really don't know. If, if Eliphaz yeah. Levy had, instead of publishing his book, had decided to start this series to found an organization. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But, you know, the, how can one tell with cultural changes like this? Because yeah, sure, I mean, there had right. been, course, there had was, been, yeah. you know, things, again, like the Swedenborgian Church, the Bemenist circles the century before then. Um, in France, by the... Um, by the 1880s, and well, in France and England, both, you mm-hmm. had organized magical magical lodges. You had the Golden Dawn in England. You had various Rosicrucian groups in France. You had, in various other places, the schools were springing up. Maybe it was just a matter of, of a critical mass of getting enough people who were interested mm-hmm. that they that that you could do something like that. But you know. One one doesn't know. <laughs> so, but that's now exactly the question you touched at what I was going to ask you, because at that mm-hmm. very same time, we have those orders that spring out suddenly. You mentioned the Hermetic Order mm-hmm. of Golden Dawn. There is this Rosicrucian order that I mentioned where, where Monsieur Costant became Helen Fast-Levy, apparently, uh, and so mm-hmm. on. And But they, again, they were rather closed door occultism. They mm-hmm. were, mm, so, but that, was that a parallel movement or did one nourish, in your point of view, the other? Oh, oh yeah. Well, the, the thing is, the underground of magical lodges had been there all along. Yeah. Um, we have we have records of, of some of those from from the end of the 17th century, and especially as Freemasonry took off, and lots of people, lots of men learned how how to run a lodge, mm-hmm. how to run a voluntary organization with its own rituals and its own structure. Then Masonry was the boot camp of magical lodges. You you joined the Masons, sure. you learned Masonry. You said, "Ooh, I can do this," and then you went off and you founded a Rosicrucian order or something like that. Yeah. And so, um, <laughs> exactly. so you. Had so you had this 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 concept of of the magical lodge as this the secret organization with the, the the knocks and the passwords and the whole nine yards, mm-hmm. um, and so that that was a continuous current all the way through there, and you constantly had these little situations where people would pop from that into public, um, you know, as with. Um, Oh, uh, Francis Barrett, who I mentioned, um, who yeah. seems to have had some kind of Rosicrucian connection. We don't mm-hmm. know which of the various Rosicrucian orders. Mm-hmm. But as once the Theosophical Society got going, once it became obvious that it was possible to to really go places with this, you had um, a lot of people from the magical launch scene got them got involved with the Theosophists. Um, Several of the leading members of the Golden Dawn, for example, were um, were involved in the Theosophical scene. William Wynne Westcott, yeah. um, William Butler Yeats, yeah, both of them yeah. were yeah. were not not only members of the leading members of the Golden Dawn, but they were also members of the esoteric section, the inner circle of the Theosophical Society. 
Mm-hmm. And so they, you know, they did what they could to to guide the Theosophical movement. But it didn't it didn't save the Theosophical movement. We can get to what happened, but um, but it certainly helped spread an interest in in occultism beyond merely what Blavatsky said and, and the various things that she taught. But it helped turn it into a general interest in the occult in, in the occult traditions and mm-hmm. the way things went. Um, I think it would be interesting now to speak about what happened to Theosophy because it's kind of typical to what happened to those movements in general, mm-hmm. even though it happened much earlier to them than to others. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, the, the, the problem with Theosophy, of course, is that during, Blava- during Blavatsky's life, it was very much a one-woman show. It was yeah. Helena Petrovna Blavatsky and the people she picked to run things for her. Mm-hmm. And when she when when she got old and, and got ready to, to die, um, of course she picked a successor. Did, did she die. ever die? Did she ever? Well, die? <laughs> <laughs> she, she would pretend probably never. <laughs> yeah, sorry, anyway, sorry, when, I had when, to say that. When, when, she, when, she, when, when she went riding off, you know, heading off to Tibet to hang out yes, with the Mahatmas okay, or good. whatever yes, happened. Exactly. At any rate, um, things ended up in the hands of Annie Besant, who yeah. was. Um, very good at organizing and very good and not very good at managing. Mm. And, um, and she had increasing problems and, and the, the whole movement, you know, there were these grand visions and plans and hopes of worldwide brotherhood and all this kind of stuff yeah. that were not going along too well. We had this little thing called the first world war yeah. Yeah. that made it very clear that a lot of the dreams of the, of the turn of the century were never going to be fulfilled. Mm. And so the theosophists bailed into, they, they convinced themselves they had a messiah. They convinced themselves that young Jiddu Krishnamurti, mm. who was the son of a servant at the uh, Theosophical headquarters in yeah. in Adyar, outside of Chennai, um, and that he was the Messiah. He was the next world teacher, a figure of the stature of Buddha and Christ. Mm. And they built up this whole this this whole messianic trip, the Order of the Star in the East. And then Krishnamurti reached adulthood and looked at the whole thing and said, you folks are crazy. <laughs> and he publicly, at, at a big public meeting in, in the United States, a big public meeting of the Order of the Star in the East, he told everyone that, no, I'm not the world teacher. There, you know, truth is a pathless land. You will not get it by following me. And he dissolved this organization that was made yeah. to, and, and the Theosophical Society imploded. Imploded, yes, yeah. It sure. just, you know, it survived. I mean, it survived, but it survived as a tiny fraction of its previous yeah, membership. Yeah, sure. and it still exists in all and of course, yeah, 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 yeah. And the thing is, this also happened, please note, a matter of a couple of months before the great stock market crash of 1929. And theos- mm. the the- theosophy had drawn very heavily from the well-to-do classes, not the very rich, but the you know the sort of middle classes and middle mm-hmm. and upper middle classes. That a lot of people who were dependent on inherited money that was what gave them the the resources and the the you know the free time to spend their time doing theosophical things. And then 1929 came along and the whole um, house of cards collapsed and an enormous number of people who had been comfortably well-to-do were fly broke. Yeah. And so was the Theosophical Society and it never recovered from that, from that crash either. Mm -hmm. So you had that, you know, the failure of dreams, you had the, um, the, the um, attempt to force, to force the universe to behave by, by getting, going off on a messianic thing, uh, very much like what happened with the new age movement and the whole 2012 business. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Which, yeah, yeah, which it, yeah. it, you know, it, it, again, the new age movement survived after a fashion. There are still new age types out there, but it's a tiny fraction of what it was before 2012. And for the same reason, if you convince yourself that the universe is going to transform itself totally and a wonderful new age of light and reason is going to dawn, you're going to be disappointed. Mm-hmm. And if you convince yourself that you know, whether it's the world teacher or space aliens or what have you, that some some phenomena is going to hand you the world you want, you know, the second coming, yeah. it's all the same shtick. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, it yeah, always yeah. fails. Mm-hmm. And there you sit wondering what happened. Well, it's just so great to listen to John and even more to talk to John as I have to possibility to i'm very grateful for that john michael greer is really an extremely knowledgeable person and you just hit the subject and off he goes and he knows it he knows it it's just amazing so 
Now let's take a little break after this interview half and we go back to the second part in a moment. The second part, which is also, again, about 37 minutes long. So um, you will enjoy that just as much as so far, I hope. Um, but now, um, well, another piece of music now. And what we are going to hear now is by a French musician that many of you, I'm sure, do know. Eric Satie, Eric Satie, I don't think we need to introduce him really. He is a French composer from, um, well, he lived from 1866 to 1925. He was a pianist as well. And he is also well known in our circles because he was member of a Rosicrucian group in, in, uh, in France at the time. And of course, he also wrote some music for their rituals, for their... Um, doings uh, and uh, what we're going to hear is now called the prelude de la porte héroïque du ciel the prelude for the heroic gate of heaven which actually was a play by a certain Jules Bois and this introduction this overture this uh, introduction to that play um, has been written by Eric Satie and it's considered one of its of his finest work of his Rosicrucian period. So um, it is. It, he was so fond of that piece, actually, that he dedicated it to himself, which I find quite funny. I think that he was not only a great composer, a Rosicrucian, but also quite a funny man. Right. So that will be the first, the, well, the next piece of music you hear. And after that piece of music, we return right away to speak again and continue our talk with John Michael Greer. And after the end of the interview, um, before I will announce what's on next week, uh, we find another very well-known sound healer of our days, Tom Kenyon. Tom Kenyon is one of the most respected sound healers actually in the world today. And it's hard to explain what he does in one sentence or two, but he is really somebody very interesting. If you like sound healing, if you're interested in the esoteric meaning and esoteric working of sounds. And um, well, what we are going to hear from him is a piece called The Voices of Iona. And well, another lovely piece for people who like a little bit the kind of meditational inspirational music well i do sometimes not always but i do sometimes so this choice i hope will make you happy as well right so once again we start with eric satie with prelude de la porte héroïque du ciel then we go back to meet john michael greer and after the end of the interview it's tom kenyon's the voices of aona <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, you were mentioning Elizabeth Levy, uh, Madame Blavatsky, of course. There is one person I would like you to to talk mm -hmm. also about because I I believe he's almost as important as the two former, but is a bit less in the in the in the spotlight. That is Edouard Chouré. Um, no, yeah, I've I've read some of Chouré's works. Mm -hmm. I don't actually know that much about the guy. Okay. Wow. I found I some. Have, I found no, you, you, that, that, I can say you're, you're, you're ahead of me. I'm surprised. Um, no, no. <laughs> sorry, that's, sorry, no the, thing is, the, the problem is there are so many of course, figures. No. I'm, all, I'm, I'm only right now, of for course, example, really yeah. starting to get a handle on Rudolf Steiner. Yeah. Um, yeah another yeah. very interesting cat. Yeah. And, um, yeah. But Shure, yeah, I mean, Shure's work, The Great Initiates, and some of his other books were in. Absolutely. And, 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 if, and Because you mentioned Steiner, exactly. That's exactly the bridge to Steiner. That's maybe why mm -hmm. I mentioned him, because being Austrian, living in the German speaking world, of course, Steiner is a person that was maybe close or still is very close to my teaching in the early in the early parts mm -hmm. of my cult discovery. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. um My question was leading to that because we often hear about the French occult revival. So we mentioned mm -hmm. that with, with Levy and his his followers. Mm -hmm. Then we are hearing about the English occult revival, which is also very much linked to the North American occult revival. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, there was Italy, there was Germany, or mm -hmm. let's say there was the Austrian Empire with Prague and Vienna, especially Prague mm -hmm. with somebody like Meyrink and those people. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, do you do you have an idea why is that only by World War II that those memories were crushed, or why is why is that part of Europe less um, present in people's minds when we talk about your cult revival? Okay, partly a, a very large part of it is simply the, the cultural domination of the United States after the Second World War. Um, mm. Everything, everywhere outside of this side of the Iron Curtain, was filtered through an American an American lens, mm. and many, you know, America, Americans are generally familiar with things that are written in Eng, uh, written in in, yeah, in, in the sure. English language. Sure. Um, a modest number of Americans are familiar with things that are written in French because up until 50 years ago, French was the usual language that you got taught if you were in the upper mm -hmm. in, in the upper echelons of American society. Mm -hmm. um, very few Americans know a word of German. Yeah. And yeah. Americans are Are, are pig ignorant when it comes to other languages, when, when it comes to cultures they don't know about. Seriously, mm -hmm. um, it's mm -hmm. one of the things that embarrasses me about, about my nation is that mm -hmm. Americans literally have no clue about the rest of the world. Um, mm -hmm. Many of them literally could not find Germany on a map. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. much less trace out where the Austro where the Austro Hungarian Empire used to be. Yeah. And so, because of that sort of that sort of U.S. centric view that got splashed all over the world by our media and our publishing industry and so on, um, the the immense occult resources of the German speaking countries have been have been largely neglected, except for you know for those few people willing to to learn a little German. <laughs> And, yeah, 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 um, yeah. yeah probably. So, so you don't think it's also a political matter that somebody like um, I don't even want to give that name, even though I think it's very important. And people are just seen as uh, being abused by fascism. That's what I think, or being fascist, and that's why you don't talk about the occultists of those countries. Or is that is okay. that? Uh, I think I think I think that might. I think that might have been involved at certain points. Uh, it was very, very, very fashionable in America to, yeah. uh, f you know, for, from 1917 onwards, it was mm -hmm. very fashionable to to think nasty thoughts about Germans. Although sure. there was there was a flip side of that. Very few people will talk about just how many people in in the run up to the Second World War were on Germany's side. There were a lot of Americans yeah. who were, yeah. you know, yeah. who were not yeah. sympathizers. Yeah. But yeah. but I think it's it's mostly it's mostly simple ignorance. Um, I would, um, well, here, here's an example. One writer who is known very well over here, um, is Franz Bardon. True. And, yeah, yeah. and his, his works were translated. They were translated into some of the worst English I have ever seen. <laughs> um, the, the early, know, the yeah. first trans, the first translation of his three main books was dreadful. You could figure out what he was, what, what, the, what the writer was saying, what the translator was saying, but he very clearly had about a high school knowledge of English at best. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. but, but those books were, were, 
were widely read. They were, you know, passionately discussed. There are there are many people over in the, here in the United States who who practice the system, especially now that there's a better translation available. Yeah. And now now Bardon himself, of course, was ethnically Czech. He was. And Czech, if, yeah, you talk, yeah, if you talk yeah, to yeah. anybody, if you talk to anybody from from the Czech Republic, they they insist on Franciszek Bardon, of course. Yes, sure. But sure. But, but he wrote in German. And mm-hmm. so, um, but he, the, this is an example of the way that something that was you know, very much part of the German occult world, the German language occult world, was enthusiastically received in the United States. And I really think if, you know, if any of our listeners has, has an interest in making a splash and you know, a little bit of money as well, translate some good German occult texts out of copyright stuff from the 19th and early 20th centuries, translate it into English. Mm-hmm. Get it placed with some American publishers. There yeah. are people out, or British publishers. Yeah. There are people out there, firms out there that will snap it up, and there will readers would love to see it. It's just that again, you know, we're Americans. We're pig ignorant about other cultures, and we don't speak any language but our own. <laughs> and one could start, for example, with the novels of the mentioned Gustav Meyrink, because they are novels oh, yeah. that easier access, maybe uh, also to a larger public. But they they have an esoteric and a really esoteric layer. So they, they, mm-hmm. that, that's something very interesting as well oh yeah no but maybe it could be great um and but but there's the one of the things that that makes this so embarrassing of course the german-speaking countries actually remained much more open to magic during that period during that that period of relative suppression elsewhere than places further west you had um the the golden rosenkreuz the big rosicrucian order that was practicing alchemy right out there in public and it had it had support all the way up into the upper echelons of society mm-hmm. and you had you know the, the various currents that that gave rise to um to friends Anton mesmer's work you had some of the occult traditions that goethe studied of course and, and so on and so on and so on and so on there was a mm-hmm. lot of stuff yeah. at a time when magic was really was really in in a dark age in mm-hmm. in france in france and in england mm-hmm. and so there's all this stuff that could be, I think, of immense interest to people if it were in a language that, again, us ignorant Americans could actually read. <laughs> <laughs> well, but you know, um, now let's go to the US occult revival now because um, mm-hmm. uh, I think that's a big part that we need to touch now when we talk about your occult mm-hmm. revival. Of course, France started it, the England and the United Kingdom followed mm-hmm. up. Um, Maybe the other way around. We don't know. But anyway, uh, about the same thing. Then the whole thing moved across the Atlantic, not only with Blavatsky, but with all kinds of other things. What happened there? Okay. So you so you had the United States. You had you had a large, rel- remarkably wealthy um, nation. It was the the play the kind of place where people could people who who were practically starving could come from Europe and, and become well off. You had a growing population. You had a great deal of interest in public education. Um, a very an unusually high literacy rate, even you know at the beginning of the nineteenth century. People were interested in stuff, and being mm-hmm. Americans, they were not especially picky. And so, mm-hmm. um, even quite early on, you had an intro when the, the Swedenborgian Church established itself over here. Um, quite early, and, and for a while, it was quite a quite a large um, presence. Of course, uh, the Theosophical Society was founded in New York City. Yes, you had true, um, true. in the big in the big East Coast cities, you had a significant presence, mm-hmm. and. And, and a lot of people, a lot of sort of, there was a lot of folk occultism. There were a lot of occult traditions that came over from Africa with the slaves, and and developed into um, the the sort of the, the southern folk magic tradition, various mm-hmm. occult hoodoo, conjure, root work, what have you. Yeah. Um, so so you had all of this stuff burbling around. Then you had Blavatsky, and then. <clears throat> Um, the U.S. government changed its postal regulations. This may not sound like a, an important detail in, in occult history, but it was huge. They changed their postal regulations so that it was much cheaper to send out correspondence lessons. Right. Okay. So in, in, in a country like the United States with the size, you know, because the United States is like, is like half again the size of all of Europe. It's big. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. it was fairly sparsely populated. People were scattered across this immense landscape. 
founding a lodge here or a temple there didn't really reach people effectively. Sure. On the other hand, if you have the advertisement in the back of the magazine saying Secrets of the Ages, send one dollar, um, <laughs> you can instantly get students from every place, from Topeka, Kansas, from mm-hmm. you know Washougal, Washington, <laughs> all over the country. <laughs> and so this that was the secret to making the, to launching the American occult revival because. As soon as the the correspondence schools started taking off, occultists, there were, of course, many non-occult correspondence schools as well, but occultists piled into that. And those that did so thrived, prospered, raked in large amounts of money, were able to afford to expand their their teachings, to run publishing programs, all this kind of stuff. Could you name a couple who were among the first ones who did that? Let's start with with the redoubtable William Walker Atkinson. Ah, yes. um, Doros, yes. Atkinson, Atkinson was, an, was an advertising executive. He had a nervous breakdown through overwork. He recovered by way of um, new thought, which was kind of the, the sort of lightweight occult, folk, popular occultism of the time. And he, he made a new career for himself as a teacher and publisher of occult lessons and occult teachings. Uh, so he settled in, in Chicago, which was in those days the hot occult center. Um, and he, he s- sent out lessons. And after he'd run enough to to, you know, you know, run enough lessons to make a book. He published his book and then go on to the next set of lessons. Um, he he was he was an enthusiastic guy. He had a number of pen names. He liked, you know, we were talking about Eliphas Levy as opposed to Alphonse Constant. Mm-hmm. Um, Atkinson was um, Yogi Ramacharaka <laughs> for a bunch of Hindu influence stuff. <laughs> He was Theron Q. Dumont for some yes. things on mind power. He was all three of the three initiates who wrote the Cabalion. <laughs> um, he was Magus Incognito, who wrote a book on the Rosicrucians. He and he had two or three others as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. He, he, so he had this. He had this empire of um, basically students across the country and in some parts of Europe and Canada and various other countries who would eagerly wait for the next lesson from, you know, from whether from Yogi Ramacharaka to teach them mm-hmm. the mystery of the, of the mystic East. Um, it was very successful. Um, let's see other early ones. Um, Oh, really, really, a lot of the ones that everyone that everyone remembers these days were came from came between the wars. The wars, yeah, exactly. Um, like Amorik, for example, yeah, or, yeah, 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 yeah. You had, yeah, 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 you had, you had Amorik, you had, um, you had Max Heindel. Actually, he, yeah, of course, setting up yeah. the the Rosicrucian Fellowship with his his sort of uh, astrology plus Christian mysticism, uh, which was a follower on. who was a follower of Rudolf Steiner somehow. Max oh Heindel. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, basically. Basically, Heindel, Heindel studied with Steiner and said, yeah. you know, this is all really good, but we need to, to, we need to transform this into a form that the average person can make sense of. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And yeah. so, and thus the Rosicrucian Cosmo conception and all this other stuff, they're still mm-hmm. going concern. Paul Foster Case is another, yeah. was another great example. Yeah. He was a, yeah. a Golden Dawn option mm-hmm. and so on and so on and so on. Yeah. 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 And yeah. so that was the, those correspondence courses. Um, and so that should, that little change in federal regulations, which which you can, I mean, at this point nobody bothers. You just um, post it to the internet and, and download it as a PDF. Exactly. But, <laughs> no, but that's true. I, I I wasn't aware of that. That's an interesting point with the with the postal uh, fee change. That's that's really mm-hmm. really yeah. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> you yeah. know, and maybe maybe the, the mystic Mahatmas from their their citadels, the Himalayas, you know, tweak yeah, the minds yeah, of some American yeah, yeah. legislators and change the law. But, but yeah, <laughs> probably, it, it was, but it was, was something up there and did that. Exactly. Yeah, there she is. Yeah, she's she yeah. beaming telepathic to the yeah. telepathic um, <laughs> influences to the postmaster general. Exactly. Um, but yeah, um, but so so the, so the American cult revival it started out very derivative from Europe. And then it got very derivative from every place in the world. America, America is a melting pot in more than an ethnic sense. Sure, uh, sure. Everything ends up here. And it, but it gradually, it, 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 very, it started developing its own flavor, its own approach to occultism. And um, uh, My theory root. sometimes is that those things in America also happen more easily than, for example, in Europe, because um, – uh, 
the USA seems to be more, if I say spiritual, I mean it also in a religious way, in a, in a general way of thinking. You would much more easily hear an American um, thank God, even if he's not a church member or things like that. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that attitude also had an influence that occultism in general as a spiritual school oh, yeah. was more easily accepted and carried along? Oh, yeah. Um, one of the things about you, uh, one of the big differences between American Christianity and European Christianity is that, of course, until fairly recently in European history, religion was very tightly tied to the political structure. Most mm -hmm. nation, most European nations had an established church. That and is it, true, was, yeah. it was, it was, you know, and and so religion was this what was was part of the social structure it was part of the hierarchy it was it was part of the establishment mm -hmm. in america that um the the few steps that happened toward that got stomped early on and then by the time we we had our we wrote our constitution um establishment of religion was explicitly outlawed and the principle was already well in place long before then that if you don't like what the minister is preaching you build your own church and say something different <laughs> yeah. and and so, and seriously, Amer American, yes, you know, um, American, uh, American religion is like it's like watching amoebas breed. They don't, you know, they just split and they go in their own direction. Um, I, I know people, people who are used to this sort of old world style of Christianity, where you have these hierarchies, where you have where everything fits. Me, American Christianity drives them crazy because mm. no two people believe the same thing, <laughs> and. <laughs> and so, and there's very much this this American ideal of, um, a, you know, coming up with your own truth and gathering enough people to build a church. Um, mm -hmm. the, w mm -hmm. Here, where where I live in East Providence, you can walk three blocks, and there's a little storefront church. It's literally in a, in a, in a, a really? used storefront, and it's it's one it's an African American church, but it doesn't have to be. It could have been almost any ethnic group. But yeah, basically, some somebody, um, a couple in this case, I don't remember their names right at the moment, but they found they they became convinced that they had a little different view of what the Bible taught than anyone else, and so they you know founded a church. And every Sunday, if you if you get within your shell, you'll hear the singing, you know, the, the singing and the preaching there. They've got a following. And of course, and tax the, laws are also very favorable of those churches yes, in the U.S. Yes, mm -hmm. tax, tax law, the, the tax laws certainly help. But yeah, America, you, you have to remember, um, the America was, was settled by religious fanatics. No, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, that, that's what I meant. I, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. America, from, from the beginning, America was a place where you went if you were, if you were too spiritually accepted centric to settle down anywhere else when exactly. um, yeah here of uh, three of the states in or three of the original of the original 13 colonies were the first places in the western world to to grant complete religious liberty Pennsylvania mm -hmm. Maryland and Rhode Island mm -hmm. you yeah. could believe anything or nothing and yeah. this at a time when that was totally unthinkable yeah. on on you know on the other side of the atlantic and so yeah we have you know and so, so so people you know occultism in america has followed has tended to follow the same the same current and you're constantly having people um proclaim you know all, all the way back through american history proclaim that they have this vision of of the nature of the world and um, the, the the occult paths to wisdom or what have you, and they start you know publishing correspondence course lessons and they attract a following and build a headquarters somewhere and away they go. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Now I have to ask you because which you're going to be surprised that I'm asking that now and not at the very beginning, but I think it's mm -hmm. somehow it fits at and now at this moment. How would you, John Michael Greer? How would you define occultism? Okay, um, there are two definitions here, and and you have to use both of them. It's one of those awkward situations where one definition won't work. Mm -hmm. Let's start with the word itself. Occult literally means hidden. It has yeah. a, I, I have to tell my American readers, remember, remember, we're ignorant. Okay, I have to remind people mm -hmm. all the time it does not come from the word cult. Okay. Yeah, yeah, oh, so yeah. If something, oh, really? yeah. yeah. If something is occult, it's hidden. We talk about like the moon occults a star yeah. when it passes yeah. in front of it's it. It's not or, the OC cult. It's occult. It's okay. not the OC cult. That'd be the Orange okay. County cult. That's yes. in California, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those churches but, we don't. We aren't talking about. Yeah, 
mean, there are plenty of those. But, yeah, <laughs> so you, so 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 there is basically, and so it is. It, occultism is the study of things that are hidden. The, it, the word occultism. I mean, it used to be occult philosophy. That was what Cornelius Agrippa called it. Three mm-hmm. books of occult philosophy. Yeah. The philosophy of the stuff that's hidden. Now. There are two where we get the two definitions that things are hidden for two reasons. They're hidden on the one hand because they're suppressed. Mm -hmm. And, of course, that's been a continual problem on and off through the history of occultism since roughly the fall of the Roman Empire. um, That occult teachings, they are a form of spirituality that is unacceptable to the the mainstream because it is not subservient to... um, to the power structures. Ruler. It is a exactly. matter of power independent mm-hmm. individual spirituality. And so it's suppressed. On the other hand, it's hidden because it deals with hidden realities. It deals with the things that your ordinary five senses will not perceive, but that you can learn to perceive by developing the subtle senses that, that each of us are born with and most of us never learn how to use. Mm-hmm. So occultism, it's a study of the occult in both those ways, of the things that are hidden because they're suppressed, the things that are hidden because they require the development of, of um, these subtle senses and subtle faculties. Mm-hmm. So that's, mm-hmm. about, that's as close to a definition as I know. Yeah, well, thank you. I, I think it's important to hear it from somebody like you as that's mm-hmm. a broad overview because you hear all kinds of different definitions and <laughs> I, 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 I'm signing on for your one. Absolutely. I'm, I fully agree. Thank you. It's, it's, it's really important um, to do it, I think. Um, occult revival, 19th century, early 20th century. Mm-hmm. Um, and then... You have the impression that World War II at some point brought it to mm-hmm. an end. I don't think it was only for um, economical reasons. I think there was no. more behind that. No, what what there, do there you was, say? There was much more behind it. On the one hand, there is the awkward fact that a lot of the that some some of the significant figures in national so in the National Socialist Party were up to their eyeballs in occultism. Mm. Rudolf Hess. Heinrich mm. Himmler, arguably Hitler himself. Yeah. And there was a lot of stuff going on with um, with the Nazi movement and so on that mm. set off a lot of people's alarm bells. And so there was from from the war from the, the war on, there was a lot of backing away from occultism mm. and because you don't want to be associated with that. On the other hand, that was also the period of the triumph of technology. Um, you had yes. uh, to, uh, you had the, the various the, the scientific discoveries that had been mostly been that were mostly made around the the end of the 19th or beginning of the 20th century finally worked their way into the technological sphere mm-hmm. during mm-hmm. the war. And mm-hmm. then all of these enormous technological innovations, all these breakthroughs that took place under the pressure of, of, of military necessity. Mm-hmm. Came into the civilian world and um, airplanes, you know, between, I mean, between 1920 and 1950, airplanes changed from um, these rickety kite shaped contraptions yeah. that maybe would get off the ground sometimes yeah. to jet airplanes. Yes. yes. And we yes. have all of these yeah. transformations. And so mm-hmm. to some extent, it was like the, the rise of the scientific revolution. People in said, the, oh, we have technology. Yeah, we don't yeah. need magic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, just, it, didn't, it didn't work for long because people very quickly realized that tech, you know, technology, it's very impressive. It looks very neat. It doesn't change the basic nature of your life at all. Yeah. And you know there are the the need for the need for meaning and purpose and value the need for a living connection a felt living connection with the cosmos which it can take away which, if you don't careful exactly mm-hmm. exactly yeah yeah mm-hmm. technology gets in the way of that but also it certainly doesn't fill that void yeah and so you have all of the cheerleaders of technology saying you know we don't need meaning and value we don't need a living connection here have a machine. It just didn't go over very well. So we had the 60s and then the occult revival of the 70s, and here we are. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, how would you place such a person like Manly P. Hall in that context? Hall is, Hall is actually an extremely important figure here because mm. he rose to prominence right about the time that the Theosophical Society was self-destructing. Yeah. Um, he was he right at the end of the 1920s when was when he burst into um, public awareness like a mm-hmm. supernova going off. And he, you know, settled he settled down in Los Angeles and built his his uh, philosophical research society yeah. and kept on teaching and kept on um, writing 
all the way through the post the the, the World War, exactly. you know, the Second World War, the post World War II period. I mean, he lived until nineteen ninety. Exactly into the punk area, right? Into yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I've read I, I've I've read this this charming article by by a a guy who's basically a punk rocker who ended up meeting Hall in Hall's last years and was going, "Wow, this guy is yeah. so." Cool. Well, <laughs> wait, wait for a talk I'll post here in a few in a few weeks with uh, Tamra Lucid, uh, who uh -huh. just wrote a book about her encounter. She was a punk rocker, riot girl uh, type, uh -huh. um, who had a seven year friendship and her boyfriend as well with Manly Paul. Uh -huh. So uh, he was uh -huh. an immortal, extraordinary figure. Uh, I mean, he, 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 was an, he was an amazing figure. Um, seriously underrated. Um, his absolutely. in particular, his book. Um, self unfoldment through disciplines of realization is the best textbook of occult spiritual development that I've yet seen. It's 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 extraordinary. Okay. It's, it's, it's Say the title again, please, reading. so that people can um, really. Hear. It's it's awkward. Self unfoldment through disciplines of realization. It's and not a snappy not title, and I'm sure that was very no. deliberate on his part. Uh, uh, probably yes. Uh, Amazing. No, and he, he just went through, as you said, from the 20s to the late 80s. And, and exactly. he's the, the, the missing link almost to that yeah, new occult revival we are somehow experiencing nowadays, right? Yeah, he, he was he, he was one of a handful of people. We talked, you mentioned Amork. Um, that, and then uh, like Manly P. Hall, or don't, come on, uh, Paul Foster cases up with the Building yes, of the Udai. There were a handful yeah. of these schools mm -hmm. that kept things going so mm -hmm. that they could, so that um, things could pick up again. Um, to some extent, you know, there was, there was the great, the, the, the era of Wicca from the yeah. 1980s and 1990s. It's Gerald Gardner which, and, and yeah, 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 which, yeah. Which distracted, which distracted a lot of people from classic occultism. And, you know, it was, mm -hmm. there were reasons for it. And, but, well, I mean, I'm prejudiced. It never, Wicca has never interested me at all. No, we, and we, so, we never, yeah. but now, now that, now that that is fading, now that a lot of people have, you know, they figured out there's only so much you can do with, with a full moon and rose petals or something. Mm. Um, you're getting, we're seeing a lot more interest in classic occultism now here in the United States, at least. Uh, yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. I think it's picking up also in Europe now. And um, oh, good. Um, would you, would you call that a new occult revival or is that exaggerated? Well, we haven't, we haven't gotten there yet. Let's see what happens over the next 10 years or so. Mm -hmm. If it, if, so far, what we have is an increased interest, a stirring of interest in, in activity. If it picks up and goes someplace um, special, then yeah, we can say a new occult revival, but let's, it's early days yet. Yeah. Yeah. What, what needs to happen? In, in, uh, do you think um, there is prerequisites are here or? I, I, you see, I think, I, I don't know. I really don't know. Um, I think what, what I will be watching for is, um, further interest in, in the occult traditions, um, more attention to the tradition, to both to the traditional teachings and to reformulations of them in modern terms. I want to see the emergence of organizations that mm -hmm. teach this kind of thing. I want to see um, also organizations that have kind of gotten stuck in a rut, um, whether we're talking about the Anthroposophical Society, which mm -hmm. has basically just been running in circles ever since Steiner died. Yeah, exactly. Um, and and which which is sad because you know, Steiner sad. was not yeah. Steiner was not saying you know uh, obsessively focus on every word I ever wrote or every, every you know word I ever spoke exactly, um, exactly. He, he was trying he was trying to teach people to become mm. to themselves become and seers thinking, to have, exactly, exactly exactly to get their mind and to, to have these experiences themselves once again and, John Wagley you are you're speaking out of my heart because I I'm, <laughs> I I got into occultism by the early books of Steiner. That's mm -hmm. long time back, and I was. Oh, that'll do it. And I and I was put off by the fact that, as we say in German, it was Versteiner. That's a, called a funny pun because, to me, to me it has become stone. You know, it has become, <laughs> 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 and because because uh, those, so to speak, followers are not butting by a, a millimeter. And I, I'm absolutely with you that he would have hated the way they do that. Oh, oh he, he, 
oh, he would have, he would have, he would have blistered the skin off their backs uh, with his with absolutely. his words. I will get lost exactly. phone calls after having said that, but I'm taking you know, it. No doubt, but it's true. It's like <laughs> yeah, you know, in, yeah. in, in, a, in a, here, here here in America, our our Christian fundamentalists have this bumper sticker that says Jesus said it. I believe it. That settles it, and everyone except those <laughs> fundamentalists giggle at that because it's you know okay. <laughs> But unfortunately, uh, too many of the anthropos- anthroposophists that I've met, it's yeah. Steiner said it, I believe it, that's settled. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. sad. You know, yeah. pick, up the, pick up those early books, do the practices, um, you know, there find you out for yourself. Absolutely. Occultism is not about dogma. It's about how it's about ex- it's experiential spirituality. And, and you will be surprised how, how far, ex- for example, his his. Um, Basic his basic um, practices that he suggests are Pythagorean partly even you know it's, it's oh yes oh good yeah, heavens yes no he yeah, he's yeah, a, yeah. yeah he's he's got a, 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 yeah. those I haven't I haven't I haven't finished as I mentioned I've only just been really getting mm. into yeah. um, studying mm. Steiner of late and again I've been focusing on the early work first yeah oh absolutely um, they, they are most to but, me they are the most interesting ones anyway. Mm. 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 Okay. Well, we someday we have to do when you have read them all, then we do a thing on Steiner. <laughs> when I have to read, when I have read them all, oh dear God! <laughs> uh, like, for those, I, who, I, they, I think it's four hundred fifty books. Are they in, or whatever, are, yeah. You know, in the in the 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 the, the, um, the official. Um, yeah, the, the collection. Of his works. Yeah, yeah, Are yeah. they in four figures yet? They're close to it. I mean, no, I mean, not quite, but, but uh, something like but 350 or something. Many hundreds, like yeah. But what, what we must say, of course, they were not written by him. They were all um, taken down stenogra- by stenographers when he had his speeches. Uh, mm-hmm. only, mm-hmm. only about the first 10 books were really written by him. Mm-hmm. And that was mm-hmm. also makes the point that he has said it, and that's why I believe it, it makes it so... Um, ridiculous because <laughs> how many errors might have happened when they were taken down? And so, There's that. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. So, yeah. well, enough of that. But um, so, um, do you think the internet plays an important part? Is that what had happened to the U.S. Postal Services a uh, uh, hundred years ago? Is that what happens to the internet now? Well, the internet is actually uh, five or ten years ago. I would have said probably not. Because most of what the internet was doing in those days was serving as an opportunity for people to get into big arguments mm. <laughs> and, and to yell at each other. But in recent years, one of the things that's been happening is that an enormous amount of, of old occult literature has been finding its way onto the internet in free downloadable PDF form mm-hmm. and, and other, other electronic formats. Mm-hmm. And more and more people are starting to go, they have what? And downloading stuff by the by the by the bucket load, I have run into more people the last just the last few years, who all of a sudden have a good working knowledge of, of you know of alchemy or of of nineteenth you know nineteenth century American occultism because what did they do? They went to archive.org or one of these other places, mm-hmm. and they downloaded two hundred books on the subject yeah. Yeah. in a period of half an hour, and so because of that. I think at this point there's a real possibility that um, that that classic Western occultism is about to see some serious new some serious new ground broken, see some serious new developments because people are actually learning about the past. They're not just you know getting the old wicker line. Yes, back when we were being burned at the stake uh, and all this kind of stuff. They're actually reading the documents. They're yeah. doing the practices. They're yeah. they're doing the rituals and the meditations and and all this kind of stuff and going wow. This and of course, works. it's easier to cross-reference. Also, that also helps oh, a yeah. lot, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Instead of having you know having to go to the Theosophical Library in the, in the nearest town that has one and sit down there for hours, you know, you should download the lot and, and start. Oh, exactly. So here's and you, this, and, and, here's and this you particular s- meditation in fourteen e- sources. Yeah, exactly. And you search whatever John Michael Greer, and you find twenty-eight uh, uh, occurrences. You know, it's that. It, yeah, it's exactly. that easy. yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely. No, it's, so, so, the, so, so my opinion, my opinion of the internet as a as a resource for occultists has improved substantially, um, just in 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 the last five years because there has been that that move toward toward online online archiving of, of occult sources and the I mean the things you can get at this point is just amazing. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So let's hope that this will 
bring that revival that you that you say could happen I, I if, would, if things go I well. I would love to see it. Absolutely. I would love to see it. John, it's been a great hour and almost 10 minutes in your in your um, company and I greatly enjoyed it and I I'm sure that our listeners greatly enjoy that as well and I certainly um, had a good time so, that's yeah. that's good I'm happy you had and so as I said we will be back with you here on the Total podcast I think it's something like February or March that we expect you to come back with that book that I was mentioning in the beginning do you want to say what mm -hmm. it is about I don't mind but I okay. don't, didn't want to, there, to, there to are, spoil no there, there there's this this is a project that I've had in in process for a long time now um, because the, the the specific thing that will be coming out at that point is the sacred geometry oracle there was a version of it published some years ago by another publisher and they did the art without my without my approval and it sucked mm -hmm. <laughs> it was not functional so but anyway there's the sacred geometry oracle it is a day it is a card deck with um ge with geometrical emblems on it drawn from traditions of sacred geometry but that is the keystone of a whole system of occult training and practice that I have worked up. And further books on, the, one of the other books on that, The Way of the Golden Section, will be released um, right around the same time. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's the sort of basic <laughs> occult training manual that goes with that. There's another one in process, in, in print, or in, in the publishing process right now, and a third, or well, a fourth it would work out to, um, that's being written right now. So there's this whole system of meditation and occult practice based on sacred geometry and Pythagorean teachings that um, I have been developing now for better than 20 years. And yeah. that's what I am. That's what I want to and unleash upon the world. That's <laughs> great. And it's very exciting. I'm very much looking forward to talk to you about that because mm -hmm. sacred geometry is one of my real central points in occultism and um, I'm delighted to hear that uh, yes and for a strange reason for four and a half years I'm doing that podcast I've never had the, the occasion to talk to someone about it um, <laughs> so probably because I had to wait for you to have those books released <laughs> no great so thank you so much once again um, you're welcome looking forward to have you back then when those when I, those I, books are out and I look um, forward to also me too so for the time being have have a good holiday season at the end of this year stay healthy and Thank safe we have to say in days. I, I will do that yeah and, and well and, some and, final and, word for our audience <laughs> um one of the basic teachings of occultism is that the um the noise and yelling of day-to-day -day of politics and society and what's in the papers and what's in the media is much less important than it looks. Right now, as we're going, we're lumbering from crisis to crisis, keep that in mind. The world is a much stranger, more interesting place than the media wants you to think. Great say. Thank you so much. Bye now. Thank you. Bye.
The Voices of Iona by Tom Kenyon, one of the most important sound healers of our day. By the way, talking about sound healing, have you already listened to the first episode of season six? Jonathan Goldman, another one of those great sound healers of our day. And if you haven't, you should go there. Tells you a lot about sound healing in general and about his work in particular, but uh, also a really great show, like the interview we had today with John Michael Greer. Thank you so much, John Michael, to have been with us today. And as you could hear, my dear friends and listeners, he will be back. He will be back in, well, I guess it'll be March or April. I can't tell exactly. It doesn't depend on him or me. will depend when those book and card sets on sacred geometry will finally be released and sacred geometry as i have told you before is one of my favorite subjects and certainly john michael Greer is one of the most instructive people on the matter as well so this will be an exciting moment for you for me and for everyone i hope involved but before we are there we have another number of shows in between and there is a very nice one next week next week this is quite a fun thing we did for next week it's two interviews actually it's two half hour interviews on with two different people um i will tell you more how that came into being next week so that everybody listens to it in the beginning uh, i will first um talk to a guy called job bitman Joe Bittman is from Seattle, USA, and he has released a book on tabletop gaming and magic, probably the first work on that all together. And um, I coupled this with a talk with Morgan Lee. She is uh, an academic, and she, but she has written her thesis on visual uh so, sorry virtual reality and magic i don't want to give away more than that now we will hear all that next week so if you are not only interested in magic but in virtual reality if you're interested in toy tabletop gaming all those things that relate those worlds together i think it's a fascinating way of linking up things uh, i had never thought about it before i was contacted by joe Whitman about his book and then i started researching into that matter i found it fascinating and so i hope you will find it fascinating too next week so come back on the 12th of december for that great um, double interview episode episode 16 it will be and uh, well that was all for this week. I hope you enjoyed the show. I hope you will return next week. And I hope in between you are going to have a lovely week and enjoy yourselves and also be careful and stay safe and healthy. Take care. Stay tuned. Hear you soon.